eternity. We're friends now. We'll be known as we were known, it says in the Word of God. So things are going to be so much different, though, so much greater and better. Eternally. Oh, thank God for the Lamb of God that shed his blood for me. Praise the Lord. Sister King. Hey, give Brother Horn another hand. Good morning. Good morning. As most of you know, for the past two months, we have been talking about uh, one of the most important functions of the church, and that is prayer. Um, I'd like to read to you today from Ezekiel chapter 22, verse 30, and this is what it says. So I sought for a man among them who would make a wall and stand in the gap before me on behalf of the land that I should not destroy it. But I found no one. So what God is saying here is that he was searching throughout the land for a person, one person, anyone, who would be willing to stand in the gap and who would be willing to intercede for the nation. And he says that he found no one who was willing to do that. I'd also like to read to you today an obituary. This is how it goes. Mrs. Prayer Meeting died recently at the first neglected church on Worldly Avenue. Born many years ago in the midst of a great revival, she was one of the most influential members of the church family. For the past several years, Mrs. Prayer Meeting has been in failing health. At the last, she was but a shadow of her former self. Her last whispered words were inquiries regarding the absence of her loved ones, now busy in the markets of trade and places of worldly amusement. Experts, including Dr. Works, Dr. Reform, and Dr. Joyner, all disagreed as to the cause of her fatal illness. They had administered large doses of organization and socials but to no avail. A post-mortem autopsy showed that a deficiency of spiritual food, coupled with a lack of faith and general support, were contributing causes. Only a few were present at her death. P.S. In honor of her passing, the church doors will be closed on Wednesday nights. So, what I would like for us to do today is I would like for us to renew our commitment to prayer. Because, as you know, without prayer, nothing great has ever been accomplished for God. We have a prayer meeting every Monday night at this church at 6 p.m., and I would like to invite all of you, no, I would not like to invite you. I would like to urge you to attend the prayer meeting on Monday nights. It is true that you can pray at home. However, as everyone knows, there is a power that is present in corporate prayer that is not present when you pray alone. So let's all get together at First Assembly of God and let's recommit ourselves to prayer so that Mrs. Prayer Meeting does not die in our church. Praise the Lord. Let's go to him in prayer. Father, we come before you today. And each one of us here today, Father, would like to just make a statement to you. We would like to say to you that we understand, that we, we know how important prayer is. You have told us in your word that we should pray at all times. You have told us that we should pray without ceasing. And so, Father, today, we want to recommit ourselves to prayer to you. We understand, Father, that unless we pray, unless we ask you, we will not have. 
You have said in your word that we have not because we ask not. And we ask you, Father, also that when we do pray, we would pray with the right motives. We ask you, Father, that you would stir our hearts to a fresh commitment to prayer to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Mm. We want to make sure, too, when we pray, I forgot to mention it earlier, that we lift up Mary Jo. She has a daughter that is in the hospital that is probably dying, passing. And for those of you that have ever lost a child, you know that kind of pain and suffering that that is, that that causes. So Mary Jo's beloved by many of us, so let's lift her up and lift up that uh, daughter of hers and um, pray certainly that she knows the Lord Jesus Christ. I can't remember if this is the one that attended an evangelical church or not, but we do want to lift them, lift them up and lift Mary Jo up. Uh, let's have the young men come forward for our missions offering right before the worship team gets started. Remember that everything that's given in this goes to missions. So we just ask you to get your change, or if you don't have any change, maybe look for a buck. any change, Brandon, but I have a dollar. So uh, let's stand together as the young men are taking our missions offering, and let's go ahead and get started praising the Lord. Amen? Don't miss anybody. Praise you, Lord. Praise you, Lord.
by your stripes we are here by his nail pierced hands we're free by his blood we're washed clean now we have the victory the power of sin is broken Jesus so one it all he is what our freedom Jesus has won have won the victory. Hallelujah. You have won it all for me. Death could not hold you down. You are the risen in majesty You are the risen King Jesus, Jesus Our God is risen Our God is risen He is alive won the victory he reigns on high our God is risen he is alive he won the victory he reigns on high our God is risen he is alive he won the victory he reigns on our God is risen, He is alive, He won the victory, He reigns on high. Our God is risen, He is alive, He won the victory, He reigns on high. Hallelujah, hallelujah. You have won the victory. Hallelujah. You have won it all for me. Death could not hold you down. You are the reason. Seated in majesty, you are the risen King. Death could not hold you down. You are the risen King. Seated in majesty. You are the reason here. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. power in the name of Jesus. 
There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. To break every chain, to break every chain, to break every chain. To break every chain, to break every chain, to break every chain. So freely given such a price, bought our redemption, heaven's gates swing wide. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power. There is power in the name of Jesus to break every chain, 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 to break every chain. Break every chain, break every chain. There's an army rising, there's an army rising. There's an army rising. There's an army rising. To break every chain, break every chain. To break every chain, 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 to break every chain. Set us free, Lord, set us free, Lord. Break every chain. Just lift up his name. Just get over in that place. Just fight through all those things that happened during the week, all those things that are on your mind. Fight through. Just put them aside and step over into that place, into that communion with the Lord this morning. Get into that prayer closet, that realm of intercession this morning. Oh, Jesus, Jesus, break every chain, break every chain, break every chain, break out, break out. Oh, Jesus, Jesus. Move on us, Lord. Move on us, Lord. Move on us, Lord.
singing out how I need you. How I need you.
Yes, Jesus, in your presence, your presence, Lord, there is life that never ends. How I need you, how I need you, how I need you. I need you. Oh, oh, Jesus, oh, Jesus, walk with me. How I love you. How I love you. Oh, Jesus, how. Burn it on our heart this morning, Jesus. Oh, Jesus, oh, Jesus, walk with me, oh, sing it out and you lift up your voice, oh, do ba da 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 ki a do so how I need you, Jesus, oh, sing it in your own way, how I need you, how I need you, how I need you, Jesus, oh, Walk with me, walk with me. Lift up your voice. Oh, Hallelujah. 
feel like the Lord is saying, my little children, when I called the disciples, I called them to walk with me. And I want to tell you, says the Lord, that discipleship is not a matter of reading a bunch of material or reading a bunch of books. Discipleship is a matter of walking with me. It is a matter of walking through your daily lives with me, listening to my voice, listening to my guidance, letting me use you. So if you want to be a disciple of mine, says the Lord, then learn to walk with me and invite me into your life, invite me into your home, invite me into your workplace, invite me into your classroom, invite me into all that you do, says the Lord, and learn to walk with me every day. Learn to walk with me. Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Follow me, and I will pour out of my Spirit upon you and empower you to do what I desire for you to do, says the Lord. Follow me and walk with me every single solitary day. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, give the Lord some praise, Lord. We want to follow you. We want to walk with you. Lord, teach us every day to ask you into our lives, to ask you into our day, to listen to your guidance, to listen to your voice to listen to your direction throughout the day, to learn to walk with you by our side, to learn to listen to you whisper in our ear, to learn to receive your guidance, Lord, uh, daily. And Lord, we'll give you all the praise and honor and glory because it's by this that we learn to be your disciples. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody that agreed said, Come on, give him praise again, ushers. Come up, receive the offering. As we give God, give, continue to worship God in our giving. You know, giving is a part of worship. If you had uh, talked to the Jewish people and understood Jewish worship, the sacrifices in the temple were the highest form of worship. And it was all giving. It was all sacrifices. And a lot of people, you know... Uh, they're all for worshiping God and singing or dancing or, or whatever else. But when it comes to giving, they ain't for worshiping God. You know, because that actually costs us something. Amen? And we need to learn that God is a God that honors sacrifice. God is a God that honors our giving and gives us the, the permission and the privilege to participate with him in our giving. So uh, learn that your giving is worship. Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus and we lift our uh, giving to you, Lord. It is worship. Father, we continue to worship you with our sacrifice. We continue to worship you with our giving. Lord, we believe you will rebuke the devourer. And Lord, we believe you will open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing that your people cannot contain. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody that agreed said, Amen. Amen. Give the Lord praise. Hallelujah. I'm going to do my best to kind of in on time, I've been letting myself jabber on. Uh, the good thing about being at a church for 21 years is that, that I'll be here next Sunday. So if I don't finish all the message in time, I just do go on next Sunday. Amen? So I'm going to take my time, but I'm going to uh, try to end a little bit more on time. Uh, the head cannot take in or the heart take in more than the seat can endure. I learned, learned that a long time ago. Uh, we're going to talk about Paul's prayers, and uh, Sister King, I hope, will be preaching next week. It's the last Sunday of the month. She's up to bat. On Father's Day, she did such a good job in her introduction before her prayer, I was ready to get up, say the, say a, uh, have an altar call, and let us go home. Amen? She practically preached a sermon. But... Uh, 
we could spend a lot of time on Paul's prayers, and we'll probably come back to them. So let's go to Ephesians 1, 15 and 16. Therefore, I, uh, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. What did he pray? That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. Paul prayed that we would receive the spirit of wisdom and revelation. Now, the spirit of wisdom and revelation. You know, in the, in the Bible text, spirit is neither capitalized in small or large case letters. So, uh, many believe that this is, of course, the Holy Spirit, the spirit of wisdom and revelation. And even if it's not, the Holy Spirit is the one who gives wisdom and revelation. Amen? How many of you agree with me? So what we're talking about is we're talking about the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit who gives wisdom. It is the Holy Spirit who gives revelation. Now, I believe that this is both mystical and practical. It is practical in that if we'll let the Holy Spirit, he will give us practical wisdom, Danny. You know, how to do our finances, how to raise our children, how to uh, be a good boss and be a good uh, employee. He will give us practical wisdom. Amen? But by the same token, the Holy Spirit can also give us mystical wisdom. He can give us insights into uh, some of the things of God and insights into uh, we'll see even the future. I've had times when... The Holy Spirit literally gave me insights into the future. Amazing insights into the future. Decades into the future. Why? Because none of those things are hidden from the Holy Spirit. Amen? All wisdom and revelation must be understood in light of the Bible. The highest revelation... The highest revealed wisdom of God. Brother Erickson's holding in his hands. Lift it up, Brother Erickson. No prophecy, no revelation, no vision, no angel reported to be from heaven is higher than the Word of God. Come on, give the Lord some praise. You know, one of the criticisms that MacArthur has made in strange fire against Charismatics and Pentecostals is he claims that we put uh, revelations and prophecies and things like that above uh, the Word of God. Well, he doesn't know the assemblies of God because one of the questions that every candidate I interview uh, that will get licensed or even uh, a certification to minister in the assembly of God must correctly answer this question, when is prophecy or a revelation equal to Scripture? The answer is never unless it agrees with Scripture. It's not even equal to Scripture, let alone above Scripture. Amen? And that is a fundamental truth of the assemblies of God. And that is a fundamental truth of, of any uh, Christian that, that understands the authority of God's Word. Amen? Uh, It must answer to God's Word. No wisdom or revelation is above the Word. All wisdom and revelation must be in agreement with historical, orthodox understanding and tradition. Why do you say that, Pastor King? Well, it's real simple, friends. Uh, Some of our theology is older than the canon of the Bible. The first... Uh, beginning of the understanding of the Trinity is older than the canon of the Bible. What's the canon of the Bible? The church deciding what books belong in the Bible. It predates it. And and, uh, I learned a long time ago, I read several interesting books years ago, and they both had a dramatic impact on me. One was 26 Ways Cults Twist Scripture. And I read that, and I studied that, and I found that, uh, that many of us pastors, especially when we're independent, we don't have any doctrinal foundation, uh, we find ourselves twisting Scripture. Uh, and, and I recognize uh, when others twist Scripture, 
because of having read that book. And then I read another interesting book that I know you all want to rush out and buy real fast, The History of Dogmas. And that's not about dog breeding. (laughs) A dogma is another word for doctrine. A dogma of the church is the established doctrine of the church. And as I read this book, The History of the Church's Dogmas, you know, and read some of the men that put this stuff together. Let me tell you something, friends. The, the men who put together the foundation of the theological understanding of Christianity were men far more spiritual than I and far more spiritual than you. Many of them far more learned in the Greek and, and Hebrew and Aramaic, way beyond what I would ever comprehend. And they were also, in many cases, deeply, deeply, deeply spiritual people who were willing to give their lives for what they believe and stood for. These people were intellectual giants. And some of these preachers running around with uh, revelations are grasshoppers in comparison to some of these people. And it's arrogance to think otherwise. I myself, you know, I'm going to confess a few things. Uh, A young charismatic, uh, raised a Southern Baptist, no charismatic uh, or Pentecostal traditional teaching. In my early 20s, I was kind of brought up into the hyper-faith movement. Hyper-faith. And their faith is important, and there are things in the faith movement that are true, but there are excesses in the faith movement that are ridiculous and do not agree with the Bible. You know, refusing all medical attention because, you know, God's going to heal you, uh, and you have to do that, which is hyper-faith, that's a lie. Amen? God can use both doctors and medicine to achieve his purpose. Amen? Amen? Or he can divinely heal you, or he can do both. They're not exclusive of one another. Because you go to the doctor with the heart problem doesn't mean God can't heal you of a heart problem. Amen? I believe he works in conjunction with those things. Uh, that one's not so bad. But another thing I really got into well, on my own, this, this I, you know, trouble I dug into myself, was I became extremely anti-denominational. I reached a point where I believed that if you participated in a denomination, you were possibly on your way to hell. And you know, you can come to those kinds of understandings when you're young, you're basically ignorant, you're untaught, you're uneducated, you have no spiritual foundation. I mean, you know, if you, if you explore the Word on your own without any kind of foundation, you can come up with all kinds of harebrained things. That's how cults get born. That's how cults become. There, was a, there are a lot of new truths out there, but let me tell you something. The vast majority of them are they're garbage. They will not stand the test of time. They're just simply garbage, especially when they contradict foundational truths of Christianity. Don't get caught up in them because you can go down the disposal with the garbage. And the other thing is, don't be in a hurry to go after every new thing. There are many Christians, buddy, every new thing they run to, to and fro, Wealthy Christians all across the country, they'll go to this conference and that conference and want to follow this new teaching and that new teaching. The Bible calls that being carried to and fro by every wind of doctrine. Amen. Many years ago, there was a young pastor. His name was Victor. I can't pronounce his last name. He was from New uh, Knoxville, Ohio, and had a radio program out of Lima, Ohio. And he began to reject all modern translations and became friends with an Aramaic man that did some Aramaic translations. And he decided, I'll study the Bible for myself. I'll throw away all of the foundation of Christianity and build my own. And the result was a cult called the Way Cult. Uh, It's not nearly as large as it once was. Uh, It's headquartered, I believe, still in New Knoxville, uh, 
Ohio, they used to have big Christian rock festivals every year. They sent missionaries out over the, all over the world. There are still probably forty to 60,000 house churches that follow the Way cult. Let me tell you some of the things the Way cult leader decided. He decided that the Trinity is not true. He decided that Jesus is not uh, omnipresent, uh, all-powerful, or all-knowing. He didn't even exist as a, except for a thought of the Father before he was created in the womb. And he was created by God creating a sperm that actually impregnated Mary. All total garbage. All complete ridiculousness. That the Holy Spirit is not a separate person of the Godhead. It's in fact simply another name for God. That cult in the 70s, sprang up all over America and attracted a lot of people from the Jesus movement with rock festivals and young people and things like that. Luckily, it's diminished quite a bit. But I even ran into some people who belonged to the way. In early Pentecost in 1914, Azusa Street having happened in 1906 and beyond, there was a camp meeting in California And right before a baptism service, one of the ministers got up and basically preached the apostolic formula for baptism is to baptize in the name of Jesus. He said, I don't believe the early church baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Well, a missionary from India got right up in his face on the stage and said, Brother, you're wrong. And they had it out on the stage. It did not come to fist. (laughs) But it did come to a lively disagreement. Well, a young minister in the crowd was confused by this. So he went back to his camp, went back to his tent, and all night he read the Bible and prayed. And when he got up in the morning, he's running through the camp, or or early that morning, he's running through the camp yelling at the top of his lungs, I've got a revelation. I've got a revelation. The name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is the Lord Jesus Christ. The name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is the Lord Jesus Christ. And from that, we got the apostolic church, the oneness church. A church that denies the Trinity. A church that at the core of its doctrine, it's not so much their denial of the uh, the Trinity that damns them, But in my opinion, this does potentially damn them. Do you hear me? Potentially damns them. Is that they believe this. You are going to hell. Steve and Roxanne are going to hell. Because they have not been baptized in the name of Jesus only. And anybody in here who has not been baptized in the name of Jesus only is going to hell. Not only that... But you also have to have been baptized in the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues. So anybody in here that doesn't speak in tongues is going to hell. And because the Bible calls that a party spirit, a heresy, a saying we're the only ones going to heaven and you're not. See, heresy is not necessarily a false teaching. Heresy is a teaching that says we're the only ones that are going to make it. And, and many churches were once close to guilty of heresies. It's, it's very common practice. You know, I can remember growing up Southern Baptist, we were the only ones that were going to be there for sure. The rest of you, we were, we were kind of doubtful about. Pentecostals, there was no doubt where you guys were going. We were stoking the furnace for you guys. <laughs> okay. Thank God things have matured and things have changed. What's your point, Pastor King? My point is this. We want revelation. We want wisdom. We want the Holy Spirit speaking to our lives. But, friends, you, we must be careful to look at the whole counsel of God's Word and to look at the history and tradition of the Christian church. You may see denominations and, and the church and think, like one young man I met, uh, he came from a very hard home background. Very difficult uh, upbringing, and he was very religious from an early age. And all the different denominations blew his mind. He just couldn't, 
he couldn't wrap his finger around that. And he, he had a nervous breakdown as a young teenager. And the first people who began to minister to him after his nervous breakdown were a bunch of Mormons. And they said, well, in the Mormon church, there's only one church. There's only one doctrine. We Mormons have it. We're right. And so he got out of the hospital, went to the Mormon church, and became a Mormon. Okay? Well, I got news for you. There are several sects within the Mormon church, including sects that still marry multiple wives. Amen? They are not a united church. The core of Christianity, I've said this uh, over and over and over, and I want to say it again. We basically believe what the Catholics believe. There's a few things that they add to it, but the cake is the same. We all eat from the same cake. That's just the Catholics use a different icing. The Baptists use a different icing, but the, our cake and the Baptist cake is the same cake. There's a core of Christianity that runs through every single solitary denomination. And that core, every true denomination, and every group that doesn't uh, uh, accept that core is outside of the faith. So when I have acquaintances and friends that convert to Catholicism, it doesn't really upset me. They just like a different kind of icing. That may, be, that may be a little too much for some of you. Some of you are having to chew over that. Oh, you know. The point is this. Revelation. You've got to be careful about the revelation that you receive. Can I get an amen? Amen. I did a little better than what I thought I would. Beware of the new wisdom and revelation that disagrees with the truth. And Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceive you. And there will be many will be offended and betray one another and hate one another. For false Christ and false prophets will arise and show great signs and wonders to deceive if possible even the elect. Let me tell you something. I know what I believe. After 40 years in the ministry, I better. I know the core values of Christianity. I like Pentecostal icing. I lather it up. I like Pentecostal icing. I am a charismatic. I am a Pentecostal. If I wasn't, I could have stayed in United Methodist and be ready to retire next year with big fat retirement. The problem was I'd have been a tongues-talking United Methodist. I'd have been a prophesying United Methodist, because I like the uh, charismatic Pentecostal icing on my cake. Amen? Some of you come to Pentecostal charismatic churches, but, you know, you're just getting used to the icing. You have got to get to the place in the surety of your doctrine. When you meet people who believe false things, there are spirits attached to that. I don't know if you've ever been exposed to people who believe false things. Uh, like inviting Mormons into your home. If you're not spiritually strong enough, you better not invite Mormons into your home or you're going to be a Mormon. Because there's a strong spirit attached to that. That's a spirit of deception. If you invite a bunch of Jehovah Witnesses into your home and you don't know what you believe and you're not strong in your faith, you're going to end up selling watchtowers. Amen? Amen? You meet people who have, how could Jim Jones, who was from around here, lead uh, thousands of people into ridiculous falsehood and, and even hundreds into taking their lives because he had an evil spirit. He had a strong, deceptive spirit. Amen. It's, it, these people that go to all these little churches where the pastor has come up with his own doctrinal truths or they follow some little ridiculous radio preacher, like the, the ones that sold all their possessions and were moving to the mountaintops and had given everything away so more billboards could, could proclaim the Lord's coming. And they sold it all and they're waiting for And then guess what? 
didn't show up, so he scratched his head and said, well, I must have been wrong. I'll find the new date. You know, how do people fall into that kind of stuff? They're spirits of deception. Amen? You need the Holy Spirit in you. You need to know the Word of God. You need to know what you believe, or you at the very least need to follow others who know what they believe. And who know what the truth is. Amen? See, I went from being anti-denominational to being wholeheartedly denominational. There is safety in being part of a denominational structure. The Assemblies of God allows a lot of liberty and a lot of in, in beliefs, except if you teach or preach outside of the 16 fundamental truths, or you begin to teach or preach something that is not a part of the cake. You develop your own icing. Okay? Uh, Kingdom Now Theology. How many of you are for, at all familiar with Kingdom Now Theology? Right. Uh, Earl Polk was the biggest uh, pro, proponent of that. Uh, and uh, a young pastor in uh, Louisville, a young Assembly of God pastor, came under Earl Polk's influence. I said on, in an Earl Park meeting, there's a powerful spirit of persuasion. I've said in the Mormon meeting, uh, all but the last session, the 18 home visits they do, because I wanted to know exactly what they taught, and I knew I was strong enough to handle it. The young Christians who were with me, they felt themselves weakening, and so I said, you guys need to leave. I'll handle it from this point. But I can tell you, I sat under Earl Polk's teaching once, and there's, there were powerful spirits of deception being released. Amen? Now, a lot of you probably think, well, I don't really care for this message. It's not doing anything for me, Pastor King. I'm not just talking about what's going on now. How many of you believe we're possibly living in the last days? What did the Lord just say would happen in the last days? Many false prophets and many false Christs would go out, and they would deceive many, and if possible, even the elect. You better make sure, buddy, you're part of the elect. And you do that by, by getting yourself anchored, getting yourself planted, getting yourself planted, doctrinally getting yourself planted uh, in every way. Can I get an amen? Let's go on. The purpose of all wisdom and revelation is to know Christ, that the God of our Father, the Lord Jesus Christ, the God of glory, may give to you a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. The Amplified says, For I always pray to, uh, to the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, that he may grant to you a spirit of wisdom and revelation of insight into the mysteries and secrets in the deep and intimate knowledge of him, the knowledge of Christ. There are wis- there's revelation and things like that that will take you from Christ. Amen? That will actually take you from Christ. A friend of mine uh, who's not a churchgoer, and that's one of the other dangers. You know, there's, the, <laughs> folks, we're under, I tell the guys at the jail this all the time. I said, all of you men are POWs. What's a POW? They're all prisoners of war. There's a spiritual war going on out there. This is, this is a fortress. This is a camp for training where we come as soldiers to receive ammunition and receive training so that when we go back out into the war, we don't get knocked off. Amen? Because there's a demon behind every corner. There's a false teaching behind every corner. There's a false prophet behind every corner ready to take you down. Amen? And when people are outside of church, they're not getting rearmed. They're not getting uh, retaught. They're not getting retrained. Hit it, buddy. And I think of a friend of mine who never has really cared for church. He's very antsy. He also smokes. So every 15 minutes, he wants to smoke a cigarette. Kind of hard to set in a church service. You know, every 15 minutes, you see the pillar. I see the pillar of smoke. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's right. 
And so what happened was, but he's a very spiritual guy, uh, but that's no guarantee of not getting deceived. Sometimes the most spiritual guys and spiritual gals are the most easily deceived. Amen? And so, you know, he would sit and read the Bibles for hours a day, and his wife began to notice uh, that he wasn't reading the Bible anymore, and his whole personality was changing. He'd gone from her sweet, loving husband to kind of sharp and sharp-tongued and kind of mean and uh, had started picking up some old habits, old bad habits. And she asked him one day, she said, Honey, you ain't been reading the Bible for weeks. What's going on? And he didn't even want to tell her at first. But she finally got him to open up. And what had happened was he started hearing this voice very clearly. Not, not as most of us hear the Lord, you know, I don't hear voices. I've only heard voices once, and that was the Lord telling me to stop and probably save my life. I hear an inward voice. Amen? But if you start hearing an outward voice, go see a doctor. And so this voice uh, told him, uh, what are you reading the Bible for, Al? What are you reading the Bible for? His voice said, you don't need to read the Bible. You have me. I'm the, whole, I'm the spirit. I will lead you. I will guide you. I'll tell you everything that's in there. Close that book. You don't need it anymore. You got me. And so he closed his Bible and just started only listening to this voice that he was hearing literally. And his wife realized, honey, that ain't the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit never leads you from Christ. The whole, and Christ and the Word are one. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. The Holy Spirit always brings us to Christ. The Holy Spirit always brings us to the Word. The Holy Spirit always points us to a deeper relationship with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Come on, give the Lord some praise. So luckily, he got delivered. And there are no other books. The Book of Mormon is a religious fiction. The Jehovah Witnesses' documents are are fiction. They've predicted the second coming of the Lord about 20 times. Judd Rutherford was a nut. Joseph Smith was a crook and a con man. I can't even say he was spiritually deceived. That's not possible. He's just plain out a crook. And everybody that follows that faith is following a total lie. That Mormons are not Christians. The Jesus they follow is not your Jesus. He just is a, is a made-up fictional character with the same name. It'd be like calling Ronald McDonald Jesus Christ. He's a totally different person, a totally different entity. Do you see that? If you don't believe me, get a book and study Mormonism, what they truly believe. You know, uh, Jesus was... The books of Mormon, the gold tablets, there was an, uh, they don't show those to anybody. They haven't been seen but once almost since Joseph Smith. And they're big on archaeology because they want to prove that, that the ancient Jews came to America and that the Indians are their descendant. Well, years ago, their far, mo- uh, far most archaeologists, their best expert, was granted permission to spend a Uh, a few minutes examining the golden texts. And he went in and he examined them. And as a trained archaeologist, one of the best in his field, it took him less than 10 minutes to determine that they're total fakes. His entire life of Mormonism, following what he could see with his own eyes, is a complete lie. He walked out of there and changed his, changed his total life. The, the pearl of great price was found in a, it's a hieroglyphics found in a mummy that Joseph Smith bought. It's been examined by Egyptologists who know hieroglyphics. Thank you. <laughs> that's, a, that's speaking in tongues right there. 
who know hieroglyphics, it's a complete fake. It's not genuine hieroglyphics. At the time that the Book of Mormon was written, which in its supposed Old Testament kind of counterpart, it claims the children of Israel escaped the destruction of Jerusalem, many of them by crossing the Atlantic and coming here. There were also several fictional books written before the Book of Mormon that told the same story. Joseph Smith, much like Scientology and Robert... uh, How many of you know anything about Scientology? L. Ron Hubbard. L. Ron Hubbard was a science fiction writer. He stood up in a science fiction meeting one time science fiction convention of writers, and said, we're all a bunch of idiots. He said, we are struggling to write a few novels and write a few dime stories, and we're starving to death. He said, all any of us would have to do is invent our own religion and we'd be rich. He went home and he wrote a science fiction novel, which he published as religion, and and, uh, now all kinds of Hollywood movie stars follow it including uh, Tom Cruise. Pray for him. He needs to get saved. He makes good movies. But he needs saved. The spirit of revelation and wisdom must lead you to Jesus. The spirit of revelation and wisdom must lead you to the Word of God. Amen? All revelation, all prophecy, all uh, visions, dreams, angels... I tell you, I believe. I don't know if I could do it, but I tell you, I think I could. If an angel appeared to me and said something contrary to what I understand to be God's Word, I would tell that angel to go back to hell from whence it came. To go back to hell from whence it came. Because the Bible said that the demons, that Satan can disguise himself even as an angel. Amen? Know what you believe. Follow others who know what they believe. Understand that the core of Christianity has been unchanged for close to 2,000 years. Understand that the Trinity and some of these things... Uh, the word Trinity may not appear in the Bible. whoop de doo Lots of words don't appear in the Bible. It's a word created by us to explain in one term what we mean by the, tri- by the uh, Godhead. It's much easier to say Trinity than go into the full doctrine of the Godhead. Amen? But that doctrine is older than your Bible And that doctrine was agreed upon by the vast majority of all the early church followers. And uh, those people who have received spirits of deception to be led away from that, they are deceived. Amen? And you need to understand that and you need to pray for them. We need revelation. We need the Lord to speak to us. Amen? We need prophecy. We need revelation. You may not... I I want to see us have more prophecy. I want us to stir the gifts of the Spirit up. You need prophecy. You need prophetic words spoken into your life. The Bible teaches it to encourage you, to strengthen you. There's some of you, you go around spiritually weak uh, way too much because you, you, uh, you don't seek the ministry of the Holy Spirit into your life. Amen? Because you're so afraid you're going to get something wrong. Well, first of all, Bobby's smart enough to know that if some Yahoo came up to Bobby and Jessica and said, sell all your possessions and go to Africa as an apostle. First of all, Jessica would say, I ain't going to Africa. <laughs> but after that, you know, he's smart enough to, to judge those things. He's smart enough to look at that. He's smart enough to to spend time analyzing it and going to prayer and taking it to others and not uh, quitting his job and selling the house and telling Jessica they're moving to Africa. Hey, <laughs> Let's stand together. I'm done. I could go on. I went three minutes over. That ain't too bad. Read the rest of it in your notes. There's, there's good stuff there. 
you need God to minister into your life. You need a spirit of wisdom and revelation. This church needs prophetic words. Uh, this church needs words of encouragement from the Lord. But they must always be judged by the faith. They must always be judged by the word. Uh, I don't care how politically correct our president gets. I don't care how uh, many people say, there, uh, you know, all religions lead to heaven. No, all religions lead to hell, but Jesus Christ, the, uh, Christianity is not a religion. The true faith is the only faith. Amen? Because the Lord himself declared that. It may not be politically correct. It may not be what people want to hear. But I'm sorry, it's the truth. Yes. And you can't apologize for the truth. I want you to come today if you want to pray for a spirit of wisdom and revelation. I want you to come today if you want to pray, Lord, uh, help me to uh, stay true always uh, to the truth of your word. I want you to come today. There are people here, you have friends, you have relatives who are in deception. And you know it. They're in cults. They're in, uh, they're in tiny little independent churches with screwball uh, beliefs. Uh, the danger of that is one screwball belief can lead to another screwball belief that can lead to another screwball belief that leads to Kool-Aid. And so we need to come and we need to pray. And if you're up here today and you're praying for healing, I want us to, to pray for you. Father, we thank you, Lord, for Harriet. Lord, we, we ask you to continue to strengthen her body. We ask you, Lord God, to restore her strength uh, uh, to its fullness, Lord God. Hallelujah. Father, in the name of Jesus, hallelujah. Lord, I come against the enemy that has tried to lie to her, to tell her that her health is not going to be restored, that this is just a part of growing old, and that she's not going to recover from this fully. That is a lie, Harriet, from the pit of hell. The, the Lord wants you to know that he's going to restore you. The Lord wants you to know that your strength is going to return fully. And to hold on to that and believe that. And to not believe the lie of the devil telling you that your best days are behind you. Uh, hallelujah. In the name of Jesus. Father God, we pray for Brother Erickson. We pray for our Lord divine healing for his body Lord he wants to go back to Africa he wants to serve you Lord God Father I pray in the name of Jesus that you touch his body and enable him Lord God to do that and Father I know that his daughters are on his mind his son is on his mind his grandchildren is on his, on his mind Lord God but Father I know that you will have your hand on Brother Erickson's entire family and that, Lord, you will watch over them no matter what he does and no matter where he goes in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Father, we lift Sherry up. Lord, we are praying and believing that this disease that the doctor says she has, it is arrested from this point forward, Lord. No further development of this thing. Let it begin to reverse itself. Because we pray for divine healing in the name of Jesus. Divine healing in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Father, touch Pauline. Strengthen her body. Strengthen her body, Lord, and be with her family. Pauline's concerned for her grandchildren, Lord God. She's concerned for them, Lord. But, Father, those grandchildren have been trained up in the way that they should go. And Pauline, the Lord wants you to know this, that they've been trained up in the way that they should go and that when they're old, they'll not depart from it, says the Lord. They will not depart from it. So do not worry about your grandchildren, says the Lord, because my hand is upon them all. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Father, we lift up Marjorie. We pray that you continue to strengthen and minister to her. Touch her body, Lord God. Strengthen her in the name of Jesus. And Father, bring her family members back to the house of God. Back to the fortress. Back to the uh, training ground. Back to the uh, supply depot, Lord God. So that they will be able to defeat the enemy. Oh, 
in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 Lord, we're praying, we're believing for every financial need that is present in this church, Lord God. Lord, supernaturally meet Eric's need, Lord God. Open the windows of heaven and meet that need totally and completely, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Father God, supernaturally meet Johnny and Roy's need, Lord God. Provide the place where they're to stay. Provide everything that they need, Lord God, in the name of Jesus. Make a way. Father, bless our brother who showed up here today, Lord God. Father, strengthen him with a spirit of wisdom and revelation. Help him, Lord God, to have total an absolute victory over over the enemy in his life, Lord. We're praying for complete deliverance, Lord, and total restoration. Uh, the things that the enemy has taken from you over the years, there are some things, lost relationships and other things that you believe you may never receive back. But the Lord wants you to know if you'll honor him in all your ways and continue to lean upon him for victory, that many of these relationships will be restored, says the Lord, that people will forgive and that people will restore you and that, it, uh, that God will do those things for you as you uh, honor him and lean upon him. Hallelujah. Father, just be with Nada, be with her, minister to every need that she has and touch her family, Lord God, in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Let's continue to pray and believe, church, for revelation and wisdom, yes. for prophetic utterance and a move of God. But let's also know that we have a foundation. And let's also declare that every revelation, every uh, prophecy, every uh, thing of that nature must answer to uh, to the Word of God. It must answer to the, what we know to be the established truths of the church. Amen? So that as a church, we can help lead others out of darkness into light. Because I'm telling you, some of you are probably totally confused by this message. But if, uh, if we're living in the ends and end times, and I think we are, deception is going to become much more yes. rampant. The demons of hell are about to come to earth and vomit up such false teaching, such false truths, such false revelations that we have never seen before. And it is time to know what you believe Get in a church that believes and and make sure that you have a strong foundation and that you're ready to rescue others who can, who can be let off in this, in this deception that is coming. Amen? Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, I, we thank you for having delivered us. I thank you for having delivered me from my own false perceptions and my own false pride and my own false... Uh, sense of, of self-importance, Lord. Those are demonic spirits that try to uh, make us believe that we're much more than uh, you have us to be. What you want us to be is more than enough. What you want us to be is more than great enough, more than magnificent enough. We don't need the lies of the enemy to deceive us, uh, Lord, into some ridiculous grandeur. Uh, even our Lord Jesus Christ when Satan said I'll bow down and uh, I'll give you the kingdoms of the world if you'll bow down and worship me the Lord knew that that was utterly ridiculous there's only one God and we will love and serve him always in the name of our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ we pray and everybody that agreed said amen amen God bless you uh, we are going to start Sunday night probably after the 4th. Uh, I need to talk to everybody. Uh, if you want to be part of the rotation and stuff like that, we need to, we need to meet because there are some things we need to do. Uh, with the worship team changing and all kinds of other things, we just need a little more time.